Okay, so good afternoon and thank you for the organizers for inviting me. I really feel honored and humbled. Um, I would like to, Stuart suggests to talk about European mortality and Middle East mortality. I don't think either of us realized what we were getting into. So if there's a lot of material here and I skip over it rather quickly, uh, there's a paper which can be read leisurely afterwards. What I'd like to do is point out, first of all, life expectancy has increased phenomenally about by about 50 years since the time of Grant. Uh, just an example, infant mortality is down to about 1% of what it was at that time. And what I want to show, in fact, is how in Western Europe, over the last 150, certainly over the last 50 years, improvements have been continuous and there's a convergence of the different countries, whereas in Eastern Europe, things have been going very sadly awry, particularly for the men. And to look with these insights from European mortality to look at what's happening in the Arab Middle East and the countries of the Arab League, and to point out that there are, in fact, very, very clear differences between different groups of Arab countries, between the Gulf states, the Mediterranean, and what I've called the second line states, uh, the Afro-Arab Afro Afro states south of, the, south of the Mediterranean coast. Um, but first, a few words about life expectancy and, li uh, life, expectancy and <clears throat> life tables. I won't go into my disagreements with Mark. Um, but I mean, basically, Grant had an amazing insight. What he's saying is, let's not look at the number of people relative to the num number of deaths relative to the number of people. Because when you do that, you get what you're looking at are differences between populations, our young populations, the old populations and you can't compare. So just, let's just take the risk of dying at each age, and what we get is the proportion of people surviving to each age. If you have a hypothetical group, 100,000 people who are born, or 1,000 people, or whatever, so you get a hypothetical number surviving to each age, which is totally independent of the actual population, and then you can say, okay, how many years is that group going to live, and Grant's 100 people live 1,820 years, average 18.2. Halley produced something similar for Breslau, or Vratslav as it's called today, about 30 years later, with a life expectancy of 33.4. Um, if you look at British life expectancy today for me, England and Wales for many, 78.1 considerably greater, women another 4.2 years, but as we can see there's also a fair amount of space left for improvement before we get to the point where everybody lives a hundred, <laughs> the point where everybody lives 110 years. Um, the life table itself, we've talked about <clears throat> its contribution to statistics, to social science. Um, it has a number of very clear advantages if you want to describe the mortality of the population. First of all, it's through the population structure. It's strictly measuring mortality, nothing to do with the population structure itself. It enables us to sort populations by the level of mortality. And it is a very good index of mortality decline of social development in general, and it's been related to all sorts of things like material standards of living, levels of urbanization, family organization, medical, uh, medical services, you name it, all of them will have been shown how they relate or don't relate, as the case may be, to, to, life, to life expectancy. However, we have to remember what we're talking about. It's strictly synthetic. It is not a measure of anything in the population. It's an abstraction. And as such, it's not actually measuring the average length of life. In fact, life expectancy is probably one of the most unfortunate misnomers there is. It is not a life expectancy. It's not the average. Most people die at an older age. They, what we call the modal age of death is the age of more, most people die around is actually a number of years greater than life expectancy. What life expectancy is, and I won't go into the details, it's in the paper, 
it's actually an average. It's simply a weighted average of the risk of dying or the risk of dying at each age. So having said that, let's look at what's been happening. First of all, we've got life, we've got data going back about 150 years for a few countries, and we can see that, well, it was fairly stable in the middle of the 19th century to about 42 or 45 for women, and then it started moving up, leveled out in the sort of 50s and 60s, and since then, life expectancy has been generally rising at the rate of about two and a half years every 10 years. Big discussions, Jim Bopel is part of them, on whether it's going to keep going or whether it's going to level off at some point. We won't go into that right now. Certainly at the moment, life expectancy is generally going up. And if we look at uh, the countries of Western Europe since 1950, um, what we can see is what was a fairly broad distribution of possibilities are following the Second World War, by the time we get to the 1980s and 90s and into the present century, everything is converging for men and for women. Um, the laggards of Portugal's caught up. Uh, the Nordic countries hung about a bit, waiting for everybody else to catch up, and then they joined the crowd. So that everything is sort of, everything converges and a general trend moving up. <coughs> All very good and very hopeful. But if we look at Eastern Europe, we get a very different story. For women, well, first of all, there's no convergence. Not for the women, not for the men. That's the first thing. Second thing is that whereas for Western Europe, everybody's sort of moving in parallel and maintaining more or less their rank, in Eastern Europe, everybody's, switch, everybody's switching over. Third thing is, for the women, well, it's not convergence, but at least they're generally moving, generally moving up. For the men, there was no change in life expectancy for about 50 years, even a slight decline. And then, well, if we talk about the trend moving up, yes, the trend is moving up, but what's actually happening is there are a few countries in what it was Eastern Europe, this is Slovenia, these one, then, then this is uh, the Czech Republic. So these are the ones that are moving ahead. But if you look at the countries of the ex-Soviet Union, they're stuck and they're not getting much better, especially Ukraine, Belarusia. The Baltic countries somehow are beginning to shape up. Um, so what I want to suggest, now one of, the question is why is this happening and what, what is really happening here? And what I want to suggest is that in fact we, Mark and I agree that the life table shouldn't be taken at face value. Um, we need to split the life table into different stages. You can see the mortality curve normal goes down, and then in some places it sort of goes up quickly. This is Russia in 1994, and in some places it sort of waits, has a hesitation, and then starts to climb. This is Japan in 1965. So what happens is, for instance, in the, just in these two countries, if we look at life expectancy, the partial life expectancy, what happens in the first 15 years, basically they have this, the same story. The average infant born following the pattern of mortality lives 14.6 years, exactly the same in both, in both populations. If we look what happens between age 35 and 60, <clears throat> something very different is happening. The partial life expectancy between 35 and 60, in other words, a person who reaches age 35, what are the average number of years they're going to live before age 60? In Russia, is about three or four years less than in Japan. Something very, very different is happening in this mid-adulthood. And what I want to look at is Western and Eastern Europe in these two different groups of young ages and mid-adulthood. And if we look at uh, the uh, young ages in Western Europe, everything converges. Everybody's living today very, very close to the full, 50, to the full 15 years. And all the countries that were once with problems, they've now caught up. Even in Eastern Europe, it's not quite as good, but even in Eastern Europe, everybody's moving up. Everybody's catching up. There's a fair amount of convergence. Everybody's coming together. 
The basic conditions, what I'm going to call later the basic mortality conditions, the basic potential for a long life, things have been moving up. Things have, the Eastern Europe has not seen a total collapse. Because at young ages, things have been improving, and they continue to improve. And there isn't even really even the big break in the 1990s at the end of communism. If we look at midlife, so mid the partial life expectancy in midlife, we have a very different story. Here's Western Europe, everybody's moving fine, everybody's coming together, everybody's moving in a tight band. This is Eastern Europe. For the women, there's a certain divergence. Uh, things just basically stay steady, not much more than that. For the men, there is a collapse. Partial life expectancy actually declines over about 30 years from the mid 60s to the, from the mid 50s to the mid 90s. The, uh, this is Ukraine, Belarusia, they're still in the doldrum, they're still not moving up. Eastern Europe, Slovenia continues to, uh, shows clear, clear advances. Interesting story is Albania, which didn't go through the collapse, but Albania was never part of the Soviet sphere anyway. So we have a very, very clear divergence between East and West, particularly with regard to mid-adulthood. So the question is, why, why is mid-adulthood? I'm not my 35 to 60 are useful ages to work with. It's not, the point is mid-adulthood. Because if we look at life, if we look what happens at young ages, what do people die of? Infancy, disease, accidents. Deaths are victims. It is a world of things that happen to people. When you move up into old, into middle ages, the question is when does this increase begin to happen? When do people start dying of cancer? When do people start dying of heart failure and other organ failure and so on? When does mortality begin to rise into old age? We're not just talking about the individual, the death as a victim. We're talking about behavioral interrelations with the world in which people live. It's not just what is happening to people, it's what are they doing, what are their behaviors, how do they interact with the world. What is their hopes, what are their fears, their despairs, what Antonovsky called the sense of coherence. To what extent do they see the world as comprehensible, manageable, meaningful. In other words, there is a dialogue between the members of the population and the, world, the social world in which they are living, which is creating, shall we say, a realization of this potential. The potential is there. We see the potential ages 0 to 15. We see the potential. Whether it is realized, whether there are preventable early premature deaths, or whether deaths are delayed, this is what age 35 to 60 is measuring. This is why I think it's important for this, this, to make this distinction between the young mortality and, middle, and specifically middle age mortality. Because again, when you get into older ages, above age 60, senescence steps in, in some people it's older, in some people it's later, but basically once we get past age 60, nature takes over again. It's that middle period that, we are that people are negotiating with the social world in which they live. Okay, so with these, all these insights, let's now see what's happening in the Arab world. This is the, the, um, the countries of the, of the Arab League, this is North Africa, this is what I've called the second line of Afro, uh, below, south of North Africa, and this is the, Medi the Mediterranean. This is the Mediterranean basin and the Gulf states. And if we look at what's happening, and um, please excuse these graphs are not to be read in two seconds. I know. If we look at what's happening in terms of overall life expectancy in the last 30 years, this is the data, and I should point out. These are not, most of these life tables are not real data. These are estimates made by WHO based on what little, on what information is available. But allowing for that, the general trend is upwards. But behind that general trend, you can really see three, these three different groups. Here are the countries, 
the, Afro, the Afro-Arab countries, the second line, nothing's happening, nothing's changing. This is uh, Somalia down here, but also if we look at Djibouti and uh, Mauritania and Comoros Islands and so on, nothing's happening. Everything is staying exactly where it was. Somalia is in the position that the Western Europe hasn't seen for over 100 years. The Gulf states are racing ahead. And then these are the, the Mediterranean Basin, North Africa and West Asia. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere in the middle. If we look at what's happening in terms of partial life expectancies from age 0 to 15, again, basically the same story, and also from ages, th- um, sorry, go back a minute, and from age 35 to 60, the same thing, a slight indication that age 35 to 60 is slowing down in the Mediterranean basin. But basically, if we leave out these countries here, these unfortunate countries here, basically things are moving in a pattern that's very, very similar to Western Europe, but at a certain one or two steps behind. If we look at the general pattern, here we can see the West, this is male life expectancy at birth, female life expectancy at birth. Here are the West Europeans, way up at the top. African, uh, the Arab countries, I've excluded the second line countries, which are obviously belong to a completely different world in terms of mortality experience. Um, basically in a similar position in terms of male life expectancy, but lower female life expectancy. And here are the uh, East European countries with a lower, in fact, lower life expectancy for men than the Arab countries of today and female life expectancy at about the same level. If we look at what's happening at age 0 to 15, there's the males and the female, this should, be, this should say female here, not, not male. Um, Ex-USSR, very, very low. Um, uh, and here are the Arab countries, uh, here are the Arab countries and the West Europeans were at the top. And the females even, and the females even more so. So basically, again, just bringing out the uh, the way that the effects of the what is happening at age at younger age at younger ages. Yeah, this is yeah, this is okay. This is males and males. Males at naught to fifteen. Males thirty five to thirty five to sixty. Bringing out that what's happening in East European in East European countries is the very low realization of basically a fairly normal mortality potential or longevity potential, which is not being realized because of the social the social collapse and the Arab countries basically moving in a Western direction, but at a certain remove actually for women with rather high relative levels of uh, life expectancy, partial life expectancy at ages 35, 35 to 60. So a few general conclusions. First of all, we have to say it again, what a big step forward the life table was. I mean, think of, sort of the situation in which this happened, someone, sort of the spark that enables someone to say, Let's think again about how we measure this. Let's take, make this, bi- this abstraction from the population to just look at the implications of the mortality rates themselves. Um, really an enormous step forward, which enables us to compare mortality levels irrespective of the age structure of the population. In Western Europe, we have consistent decline since the middle of the 19th century and in the late 20th century, convergence and very little variation between the countries. Eastern Europe, the increases for women, not for men. No convergence and a very clear distinction between Eastern Europe and the ex-Soviet Union. The Arab Middle East, distinguishing the Gulf states from the Mediterranean basin from the second line African states. Um, and the second conclusion that we should distinct, if you want to understand what's going on, 
and not just talk about mortality collapse in Eastern Europe. We need, do need to distinguish in mortality at young ages the mortality, the longevity potential from its realization in middle ages. Uh, the crisis in East Europe is a crisis of middle-aged men and is continuing, particularly in the ex-Soviet Union countries. The other, some of the countries of Eastern Europe are getting out of it, but not all, not all of them. Major feature of the Arab states is the small gender gap. I didn't spend enough time on that. The small gender gap between um, male and female mortality probably indicative of excessive mortality for women and not insufficient mortality for men. We are, we're seeing here a reflection of, male, of relations between men and women in these different societies. So the and the advances in Western Europe, and we are all critics of Western Europe, um, from within, perhaps, but the, advantage, the advances in Western Europe do highlight the tragedy of other countries, Africa south of the Mediterranean coastline, where mortality remains at a level it was in Western Europe 100 years and more ago. And in East Europe, particularly ex-Soviet Union, the collapse of, of longevity conditions, the collapse of living conditions, um, particularly for men in Middle Ages. And what all this brings out, of course, and what I say all the time, is that mortality is a social phenomenon. It's not just an issue of people dying, but it's the conditions under which people live and die. And that social collapse is clearly reflected in mortality crisis. Thank you very much. <laughs>